Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Atomy Brainwaves, our podcast on education for educators. Brainwaves is produced by our wonderful team here at Atomy, an online teaching and learning platform for secondary education. We provide engaging, curriculum-specific videos and text lessons for over 190 subjects, as well as matching quizzes and exam practice that can be used for both learning and formative assessment. We also provide powerful analytics that can help teachers diagnose how their students are progressing and zero in on who might need a little bit of extra help. We aim to make life easier for teachers, give them more time to work on the most important things, and ultimately help to generate better outcomes. If you'd like to find out more about Atomy, head over to getatomy.com and feel free to give it a go for free. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking to innovation in learning and design expert Steve Collis. We spoke about the importance of how people, space, and culture interact in a learning environment, Steve's role in making this as productive an interaction as possible, and heard about some of the best examples of exemplary learning innovation encountered by Steve in his career. If you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your platform of choice is. And if you're feeling it, leave us a cheeky five-star review. In the meantime, enjoy. Are you going to teach us anything? What, you want me to teach you something? You want to learn something? All right. You got it! Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Atomy Brainwaves. I'm your host, Simon, and I am joined today by our very special guest, Steve Collis, head of workplace strategy at Amicus, thought leader and keynote speaker on learning and innovation across multiple continents, formerly the director of innovation at Sydney Center for Innovation in Learning, and going all the way back, an award-winning classroom teacher. Welcome, Steve. Hi there, Simon, um, and hello to your listeners. And well, uh, yeah, what an introduction. Um, but uh, here I am sitting in, uh, you know, week, week two of work from home. Uh, I can hear a little baby waking up in the background there, and uh, but, but, but keen for a really, uh, really good chat. But uh, yeah, it's funny with those intros when you hear, um, hear your story read by somebody else. But uh, um, what, a, what a funny situation we're in right now. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very true. I was almost thinking as I was saying it, you know, throwing out the multiple continents and keynote speaking there, which is, of course, true. But uh, won't be any intercontinental travel happening anytime soon for any of us, unfortunately. But no, um, isn't that... Isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that true? Hey, miracles of modern technology, though, we're able to have a chat like this. So I suppose silver yeah. linings, we find them. Yeah. We find them where we may. Absolutely. And my level of guilt uh, when flying has gone up exponentially the last uh, couple of years and really racking my brains for a way to, um, to stop flying, actually. And uh, I'm so intrigued in this current period that we're in as to some of the lessons we might learn and just normalizing virtual connections. It's so clear the virtual connection, like a video conference, is it's 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 not the same as face to face. No, of course. Um, but maybe it's good enough, and and if it's what our planet needs, then um, maybe this will shift the tide, I guess, on what becomes um, a normal habit. So there, there's a bit of hope there. Yeah. Wow. We've already we've touched on climate change, and we're only a few minutes in. We're uh, covering all the big yeah. topics <laughs> straight out of the gate. <laughs> anyway. Put a tick there, put a tick in that box. Um, we, we certainly will tick that off the list. So in terms of topics, our kind of central topic for the day is uh, your sort of area of expertise. I think it'd be fair to say innovation in learning design. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that in detail. But before we do, uh, as regular listeners will know, we, whenever you've got a special guest on, we always like to start with just getting a brief review of your journey in education going all the way back to your to your teaching days how you got into it um i guess up until up until the present day yeah uh yeah sure um and a great place to start because i think our journeys and our experiences always impact how we view the world and and the strengths and the insights that we have i believe that we each have different insights and that they're very often complementary we catch each other's blind spots uh, I landed in education uh, as a high school teacher uh, in, I think, 2001 as a French and English high school teacher at a small school with about 350 kids on the north of Sydney called Northern Beaches Christian School. Um, and my first day, I remember still for many teachers that their first, their first week, their first year is a little traumatic because there's me and rows of desks of 30 kids 
and I've got to teach them French, and they don't necessarily want、mm. to learn French.、Uh, and so, what? In, what? I'm shocked to hear this. <laughs> Unbelievable.、Dude. In Australia, personally, I loved French. Yeah. yeah shocker. Ah.、Oh, anyway, anyway. You know, like so many teachers, it feels like a game you just can't win. Uh, and so that was certainly my opening chapter,、uh, and but、um, by fortune uh, uh, or luck,、um, I was at a, the school had just got a new principal, and he was、um, keen to do anything to break that model of teaching that I'd landed in, and、uh, we grew to about thirteen hundred kids, and we were able to do capital work programs at the same time to to cater for that. And what ended up happening over the next、um, five or eight years was I was caught up in an innovation movement at the school. I mean, his mottos were "Do then think,、uh, ready, fire, aim,、uh, question everything." That's what he was saying from a leadership perspective. And、um, we were able to break everything that we knew to be school over time. And one thing that was special that occurred is we were able to scale it. Heaps of schools have little pilot projects, really cool little projects running. But we were able to scale it around the whole school,、uh, and、uh, ended up from about、uh, 2010, we were getting so many visitors that we launched a consultancy from within the school. So I ended up、um, first of all, it was just showing people around and trying, like showing principals and leadership teams from other schools around to sort of see what we were doing. Um, and then we realised that uh, um, we hadn't decoded, we hadn't,、um, we hadn't figured out how to explain the successes that we'd landed on in our inno- in our innovations. So we started charging. It was a bit of a risky thing to do. We 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 charged our 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 the other schools that wanted to come, and we used that to、uh, resource、um, offerings to them to to help them figure out their journey. Um, and、uh, and then a couple of years ago, well, actually, twenty sixteen, so a few years ago, after doing that for a few years, I took a deep breath in and came over to the corporate world. So the last three or four years,、uh, I've actually been working in in the reason why I made the jump to corporate、um, is because I, I, I it dawned on me that actually the the world of work was facing really the exact same. Issues. You talk about moving from a factory、yeah. paradigm away from a factory paradigm. You talk about questions of intrinsic motivation and engagement. Workplaces are talking about exactly the same things, and those the, the the lever of being able to change the very environment and therefore change the mindsets and the culture.、Um, it's exactly the same conversation. So I've been working in corporate for a few years now. That's been a hell of a learning curve for me. Uh, but now, what I'm、uh, really keen to do is to unite the two worlds, because、um, I think often the problems that we're wrestling with have been solved、um, by other communities and other domains outside of our current experience. So the best place to look for solutions is not within your own backyard,、um, but it's to look at other exotic um, um, domains. Uh, and not the corporate、mm. is a, a corporate space is utterly exotic to schools, but、um, but you, you got to look outside the fence. And I'd I'd really love going forward to unite these different、um, conversations. That's a that's that's the that's the quick version of how we got to today. Well, it's it's a it's a really fascinating journey, and I suppose a pretty unconventional one considering you know where it started all the way back in the days of of, of French teaching. But one, would it be fair to say what comes across? Uh, and what you're saying is, it was a sort of, it was never a, a a set roadmap of a plan in that regard. Was it? It sounds almost more like an organic process that came out of, out of the combination of the school where you found yourself in, and、um, you know your own reacting to that, and and sort of reacting to situations and evolving is how you ended up moving from that specifically education based into the corporate world and onto the goals you're talking about next. Yeah, a hundred percent, and I think in that description, you've you've captured、uh, what most of our life journeys are like. In fact, what life is like, and actually, I think that insight needs to feed back into school,、mm. because one thing、um, I always resist and have always tried to、um, yeah present a countering view to is. Is a vision of learning of of kids learning that is strictly linear and predictable. So in no other part of our lives do we experience journeys that are like that. We、um, often 
um, experience times of stagnation and then sudden growth. Um, we bump into the right person. We uh, we bump into the right little bit of knowledge or insight at just yeah, the right time. It takes us out of our comfort zone. Yeah, or and so why... Going back to go forward, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, then we, and then sudden leaps forward happen. So... So all of the inf the architecture of schooling that uh, presumes linearity, I mean, just the lesson plan, the idea that 30 kids with different moods, different personalities, different background knowledge, and we talk a lot about differentiation. Um, and when I started teaching, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about differentiation. But, you know, um, it, it often meant um, a, a secondary plan for the uh, for the quicker kids and a, and a third plan for the kids who were struggling. And so suddenly you've got to have three different hats on and it still doesn't work because now you split the 30 kids into two group, uh, three groups of 10 and you're trying to be in multiple places at the same time. Mm. You cannot control this. Life is not controllable. And so the mindset of controlling and measuring and um, uh, that's everything to me that's in factory, factory thinking. It's very reassuring. What a reassuring vision of the world. But as we've seen right now, history just does not obey the rules and, and nor, do our, nor do our experiences. Yeah, absolutely. We're very much seeing that to be the case now, aren't we, in the midst of everything we're going through here? But yeah, I guess, you know, just to tie it into this, I, as we move into this idea of innovation and learning, what's really resonating with me is this idea of the different elements of, of, at play, you know, this, this culture that we have in schools, that perhaps more traditionally has been this sort of, as you're saying, factory style, very linear, very planned out. Then you have the other element, the probably the most important element, which is the people who are in the room, the teacher, and of course, the students. And then another element to bring it in would be the space, the actual physical space in which they're operating. And, you know, I know in your work you it's kind of like a, a description you can use is to to be at the center of this space i suppose between those those elements people space culture and i was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be in the middle of that how these elements interact and your role within that so the the my passion for that i think um i trace back even to you know, wanting to play Lego as a kid, and then as computer gaming environments developed, um, uh, uh, getting in, you know those endless hours building building worlds in certain computer game environments, and then reading science fiction. And when you read science fiction, the whole fun of it is they're building an alternative world, and you're going, "Hang on a tick." So, so um, it casts light on your current situation because the world doesn't have to be this way. The world, I think travel o o often triggers the same sort of passion in people is, is it doesn't have to be this way. And the, the core, the core insight that has become the defining driver, I think in my life is that ultimately who we are and our attitudes and our emotions and our actions from moment to moment we, we'd like to think that that's a matter of personality, but actually, to a, to a large degree, it's a matter of the situation that we're put in. And so, so situational factors become as much part of who we are as what's inside our body and our brain. Um, so anyone who's been really chilled one moment, but then gets behind the wheel of a car, and I've seen this happen, these lovely gentle people who suddenly become mini monsters when they're driving in traffic. So their personality hasn't changed. Very real. Very, very real. real, right? So, but they're in a, an enclosed car, yeah. uh, this enclosed space. They don't have face-to-face um, -face contact with the other driver. Um, they've probably got this mental habit of sort of getting into a bit of an us versus them mentality whenever they get into that car. So that car has almost got a mental baggage that comes with it that has built up over time. The car is probably triggering previous memories of when they've had altercations with other other vehicles. And so all of this teams up to make them someone who's almost unrecognizable. So that that's the core insight is that actually who we are um, is massively um, influenced by what we surround ourselves in. So my obsession has been to try to build little mental models and little maps that will allow people to reinvent themselves 
by reinventing the situations that they're in. And a classroom is just one example of that. A classroom is a artificial situation. The idea of rows of desks facing the front, not that anyone does that anymore, um, or, or, you know, it's a, it's a fading habit for sure, but, but to use an extreme example, rows of desks facing the front, but uh, uh, the, the model that we currently use, um, uh, that um, uh, yeah, re used to um, use a model back in my schooling days and then rebuilt it um, a few years ago. And the, the, the one that I go to now, um, which we created, it's called Touchline. And it says, let's try to map um, where the situational circumstances around us reach in and touch us. So they change us, they change how we think or behave. And we say there's three touch lines, there's three aspects of the situation around us that reach out and have an impact on us. There's the physical aspects, there's information flow aspect, so the way information flows in the environment around us. And then the third layer is the shared understanding, what we call the shared understanding space. Um, and so physical, you go, well, in a classroom, rows of desks facing the ground, that configures it configures a certain psychology. It, it suggests that the teacher is going to be the big director here. Now, you can put kids in group desks, and that still remains the subtext, though, of course, um, until you get real freedom of movement through physical space, until, until you create empty space in a physical environment where it's literally unconfigured. The kids can actually create the space themselves. Until you've done that, that physical mm. space is really um, has an agenda that is telling the kids that they are not on their own turf, they're on somebody else's territory. But then take, uh, when we look at the information space, you know the old, uh, the old saying, information is power. And it's so true. Mm. And in, in 100 years ago, um, even textbooks would be expensive and perhaps a little bit rare. So, so literally the teacher was the only person who had the knowledge. Um, but as soon as even just paper becomes... With, with printed knowledge becomes a bit more available. As soon as you start having encyclopedias at home um, or a book that you can borrow, it's actually quite subversive and it's empowering and it allows kids to access that core information when they need it, let alone transmitting information from person to person. Think about this, in the, the notion that in a, a learning space, passing a note from child to child, like a little, somebody passing a little social note around the room would would um, might be considered against the rules, but that's actually information flow. Those kids are trying to talk to each other, and and they're interested yeah. in their own social fabric. So information flow becomes this really interesting line of inquiry, and then finally this idea of the shared understandings we bring to the space. So teachers are typically really aware of this because they set you know we set up rules. What are the rules of engagement? But the more you look at those shared social contracts that we bring to a space and we associate with a space, the more that comes out of the woodwork. So sometimes these are formal. Sometimes you put them up on a poster on the wall. But a lot of the time, they kind of write themselves. And uh, so, yeah. so what I love to do is to try to bring all of this stuff out of the woodwork and say, let's take an inventory of the circumstances we've set up in this situation and next, let's go, to a, let's go to a blank slate and rewrite every aspect of this. If we can move furniture, if we can change the physical space in some way, change those information flows, and then change the sort of social understandings that we're bringing in that govern how we interact. So, And, and to what extent, mm. sorry to cut across there, but just one thing that's coming up for me here, I think it's a really, it's, it's a fascinating way to look at it with this kind of three-pronged approach, but when you're talking about that idea of redesign, to what extent do these three elements impact one another in that question of redesign? By that, I mean, you know, to what extent should the physical layout of the room be rearranged so as to facilitate information flow or vice mm. versa? You know, to what extent does shared understanding get molded by actually how the chairs are positioned or is it the other way around? I know it's kind of an abstract sort of a question but i'd be interested to hear to hear your thoughts on it i think it's it's important because i often um often when people are trying to redesign um a, a, a situation like a learning a, a learning context um they alter uh certain elements in certain in, in in one of these layers or even a couple of these layers 
but then because we're fi we're fish in water, so what's familiar to us becomes invisible, and so often other elements are left unchanged. And what that does is the space basically fights itself. So imagine a teacher who's um, created a bit of choice in their overall learning architecture. So you know, for the next week, you guys can work solo or you can work in a group and you can choose this topic or that topic and you can um, express your learning in um, either written form or in a presentation. And then, of course, the physical space just will not allow any physical movement. Um, yeah. It doesn't have the tools that they need. Um, the teacher may have um, tried to decenter the attention from themselves as the expert but has not, haven't, haven't provided alternatives. You know, there's this big question of direct instruction that's always been hovering around or, or you know, explicit instruction. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and there's always a question of pendulum. So suddenly that gets demonized. Oh, the teacher can't be giving explicit instruction. Well, actually, the best way to learn something that you don't understand is having an expert explain it. Um, yeah. So let's yeah, not it, it, get... It's a necessary part. It's yes. whether or not it's the full part of it. it that's kind right. Of, you can't learn something in a vacuum. There has to be some degree yeah. of explanation. And so let's not throw that out. Let's just be sophisticated about it. And so, yeah, so I think um, spaces, uh, these the sort of, uh, as you scan, as you scan the situational circumstances we set up in learning, they often fight each other. They often send mixed messages. And that's where a lot of stuff becomes undone. Um, so, so aligning those, and actually it's, it's partly around taking a full inventory. Let's figure out the human journey that we want to design for. Um, and we're very quickly, we're going to find that that's going to be multiple. So it's not going to be one linear journey. So let's, but let's do that mapping and let's look under every rock and stone and get the setup so that it's, it's aligned with what we envisaged and then you get success. I think it's why when our principal was saying, question everything, he was giving us permission. He was giving us a shared understanding that um, there were no limits to what we could redesign. Um, we didn't just need to tinker. It wasn't just about tinkering around with some of the cosmetics, but not really going deep into the structures that were, were making life difficult. Yeah, which can be a daunting prospect i suppose as well because when we when you talk about that that element that side of it which is this you know it's not a straight journey and there's so many different variables at play and going back to go forward and learning through stagnation and elements like that i suppose that can be daunting within that so how is i guess how is that overcome would you say when talking to when introducing these ideas of getting out that blank slate, how do you reconcile teachers with the, I guess, the difficulties, the, ex is the excitement naturally, but also the daunting, difficult element of it? Yeah. Well, it is daunting because school, school, the school situation is not like a nuclear power plant. None of us really know how a nuclear power plant works. But all of us... No. Went well, to I hope the people for, who work there do, but... They, they do. Everyone and, outside, yes. Um, but uh, everybody went to school for 13 years, or however many years they went to. So, And we see it portrayed constantly in soap operas, and we see the hands going up and the regimented setups, etc. So it's not just that teachers know about teaching, it's that all of society has a deeply ingrained vision of what a learning space is. And so to change that feels like um, you, you're particularly like you're going into the unknown. Furthermore, teachers, um, if they survive their first few years of teaching, they've often invested incredible amounts of energy and gone through quite a lot of suffering making the, the traditional model work somehow. So to then to suggest to them, let's change it, is particularly daunting. Yeah. Um, and deep in this model is, is, is a question of control and, and of managing. Let's do classroom management. And so to, to stray from those core concepts is daunting. The way we saw it play out um, and, and what I would always suggest when working with other schools was um, it has to be iterative. And so um, it has to be team-based. So really um, the, 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 the starting point is get teachers in a team because it's really, uh, it feels 
um, ever so vulnerable to go out on a limb by yourself as a lone wolf. You know, uh, teaching can be lonely. Um, but if you're there in a team, and then when when things don't work, and when um, you know, which is inevitable when you're innovating, um, mistakes are learning that in themselves. So you want to you want to have innovations that don't work because they're a bridge to something that will. Mm. So get teachers in teams because then um, it's much easier to be courageous and it's therapeutic to debrief. And furthermore, involve the kids in that team as well. So now that the now the kids are part of the solutions creation as well and they're co-designing with you and suddenly so much of the fear of innovating is neutralized just by getting in a team and then um and then this iterative iterative approach but a lot of schools uh will go oh next year we're going to do this we're going to launch this amazing program with year seven and they spend six months planning and getting teachers meeting and and then the next year it, you know they've created this massive program and then it launches it's a mixture of success and also not so much success mm. but they've gone at about a thousand times slower the pace that they should have do it next week change it next week and run the experiment for a day or for a lesson and then learn then like um go at the speed of thought yeah. um slowing down is just a sign of uh, of fear and the quicker you experiment, the quicker you're going to land on some really cool outcomes. So I'd say iterate, get in a team, and um, and experiment really aggressively. Um, otherwise, you'll be there in five years, and you'll still have a few pilot projects, and um, uh, you just don't have any genuine momentum or genuine transformation. We um, we we hit a few really great wins early on. Um, uh, I, I think. Just to mention a couple, there were a whole stack of them, but a couple of them, um, but yeah, but almost by chance we we landed on them. But once you land on a real success, it goes a bit viral. So that's what drove change at our school: is the good ideas sold them sold, sold themselves. So one was just team teaching. So two teachers with sixty kids rather than one teacher with thirty kids, and that that means knocking down a wall, right? So or finding a shared space. But what it meant was that the kids who didn't like one teacher... They had another could, option yeah, um, available. They had another one. And it's no one's fault. But so much of learning is, do you bond with a teacher? And not everyone's going to bond with me. Um, and furthermore, um, in terms of expert instruction, it meant that one teacher could be delivering expert instruction in one part of the space, while another teacher was working with the kids who didn't need it. So you suddenly had two... You had a... Uh, uh, an order of magnitude higher in terms of the level of sophistication of activity in the in in that. Furthermore, the teachers were learning from each other, so they could see each other, see see their tone of voice, see the way they ex they explain things, see, saw their patterns of engagement with the kids. They could divide and conquer with the planning. It just worked on every single mm. level. And the other one was um uh, uh, instructional expert instruction online in the forms of videos and. You know, this went via this eventually. Um, I mean, we were doing this back in two thousand and five, and eventually it it went viral through society under the name of flipped learning, and mm. um, that was fine. That the idea of flipped learning was always a little clumsy because you were suggesting that people were going to look at the videos at home, but it was almost just as artificial as the original setup. It was trying to cure. Whereas what we landed on, and I think schools end end up getting here, is let's make instructional videos available permanently and sometimes the kids will access it in class sometimes in the playground sometimes on the bus sometimes at home and but it it created a, a huge alternative to constantly waiting for the teacher to get up to the right bit of explanation um, so that, that's just two experiments but I think you've got to land on them in practice and then it builds confidence because if you get to the right technique it engages kids um, it makes life easier for everybody and it, it unleashes potential. And then you've got a bit of seductive, seductive momentum. What you don't want is, and so often in schools, it's duty. We've, we're, we're, teachers are surrounded by duty. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Whereas when it becomes fun and seductive because it just works, that's when you've got a bit of, you, you're unleashing a bit of inspiration across the school. And that's, uh, I think that's critical to getting genuine transformation. You can't just be 
doing it because it's the mas- the five year master plan and it's written on a poster somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, so a lot of that resonates with me just hearing it. I mean, even what you're talking about in terms of of online videos and having their availability. I mean, that resonates so much with us here at Atomy because that's obviously so much of a part of of our own um, resource. But what you say there about you know the the, the five year plan and all the best planning in the world versus this kind of speed of thought it kind of it brings to mind a phrase I actually came across um on your website, which I really liked, which was this sort of juxtaposition of culture and strategy where um you know mm-hmm. you say uh culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which i really uh, I really enjoyed I think it's a really good line, but it's it's sort of i guess this is what you mean by it right it's it's this idea of having that culture to learn as you go and be open to it versus this prescriptive long-term plan. Because even if you're planning ad nauseum for innovation, it's still actually the same way of thinking as before. It's still planning. It's still set in stone, no room for, for, for change, yeah. ironically. Yeah. I mean, I picked up that quote from, um, I think it's, some it's one of those, uh, corporate thought leaders and it's, it's gone viral as a quote and I've certainly, uh, I certainly, I you, use it a you've, lot. You've stolen it. To... You've made it your own. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Mm. That's 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 ninety nine percent of creativity. Is is that? But of course, of course. yeah. And to 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 convince leadership teams as well that um, uh, that culture is the end game um, because strategy is around what we're trying to do, um, but. Um, but uh, it stands and falls with with what people actually do one moment at a time, and that's governed by a culture. So culture's such a strange word. It's it's abstract. It's amorphous. We kind of feel intuitively like we know what it is, but if you try to get people to describe it, they they often end up struggling, mm-hmm. and rightly so because it's there's something a bit collective about it. But it's as real as a wall, as as real as a brick wall. And it's it's the beating heart of human fabric, uh, and you know families have culture. We know classrooms not only have culture; they have subcultures, yeah. <laughs> um, and schools absolutely have cultures, and then societies have cultures. And time and time again, whatever it is that leadership's trying to do, or whatever the official roadmap is, um, it 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 stands or falls with whether it gets embedded at a cultural level, and so culture becomes the end game. Hey folks, hope you're enjoying the episode so far, and we've got plenty more to come after this quick break. Here at Atomy Brainwaves, we're all about education, and not just for students, for ourselves too. We would love to hear from you, whether that's feedback on one of our episodes or a question you'd like to see answered by one of our guests or by Sue. So if you've got a comment or a question, don't hesitate to email us at brainwaves at getatomy.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, let's get back to it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's as you say, it's an elusive term, but it's it's such a vital one and and so important. And it's so great to hear this. You know, you're putting that at the centerpiece of um of what you're doing. Um, I just wanted to move for a second and kind of get into the weeds a little bit more, away from the kind of higher order ideals and sort of down into not quite the nitty gritty. But um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the idea of designing for emergence. I know this is something that you've you've written about. Mm. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that and why. I know you've described it as a paradoxical art, and um, you know, explain to us why that is that is the case. Yeah, so it's paradoxical because um, designing. Um, means that there's a designer and that that designer has an idea about the future. Um, Whereas the meaning of emergence is that um, you don't quite know where it's going to go. And so how do you design with emergence in mind? And um, what I kept encountering is uh, binary opposites in people's thinking. So you go, typically, and I saw whole schools doing this, is... If we're not running a constrained classroom where the teacher's pre-scripting what happens, um, then the solution must be to let the kids just roam free in a vacuum. And so you get these really simplistic notions of self-direction. 
Um, and then and then reactions against that very very rightly so you get critics saying well kids don't learn in a vacuum and they need to be taught and this is just going to be anarchy and that's true as well so human beings live somewhere in the middle we're constantly constrained uh, I live a life of constraint I can't just do whatever I want from moment to moment I've got all of these social obligations I've got rules I've got to follow I've got work policies I've got all of these responsibilities and so we shouldn't try to cure that there's we, we don't want to um, fall into a, a sort of a vision of, uh, do you know Rousseau's idea of the noble savage is what's wrong with society is, is, is society. So if we just put people on a desert island, we'd, we'd be able to get back to perfection. So, so what ends up happening then is designing uh, deliberate constraints. So, so, so it's not that you demonize constraints or rules. So imagine, imagine then we're getting a, a, a teacher um, team with some students in that team as well, and we're trying to design um, a roadmap for term one, right, for, for a okay. cohort of students. So I think you need a designer, first of all. You don't just get in there and muddle your way through. Is I, I want other people to design for me, and if I'm going to be a learner, I want someone to have done the spade work. So first of all, we might start with a narrative. So a narrative is an overall overarching story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a shared goal. Let's not get rid of shared goals. Um, uh, yes, each in, each kid is an individual, each learner is an individual, but we constantly have to be collective, and there's no we shouldn't go to a point of absolute freedom. Life is just not like that. So let's have a shared narrative, and then within that, so I, I started I started using the term learning landscape, and so we almost visualise this as a as a, as a map, and we say, no, there is a shared journey here, and we need to define that. Um, there might be a prescribed topic, etc. That's okay. And then we need infrastructure that sort of then governs movement through that learning landscape. And I don't, you know, the, the, the right amount of constraint and freedom, I don't know, it depends on the situation. But the sort of ideas we'd land on is ideas of certain milestones, certain resources to help the, the, the kids along the way. Often what ended up being really promising is you, is you map, you, you, you design a learning landscape so that the kids who can really go into a vacuum, like that, they, they're the sort of kids who will, they'll research the information they need, they'll ring up the person they need to talk to, they'll create the project out of nothing. Let's create a bit of space so that those kids get that set up. And then the kids who are really genuinely at this point in time, they need tight constraint and tight help and they... They need much shorter cause-effect loops. Um, that is to say, um, they need to be interacting, um, you know, every, you know, in a matter of minutes, not in a matter of days or weeks. Let's make sure that those mechanisms yeah. are in there. Well, what we're talking about in practice there is let's have um, let's have uh, a teachers a teacher help desk in the corner. And let's train the kids yeah. to realize to what degree they need to go to that help desk. Let's let's create. Because I was going to ask, what does that? How does that manifest in a physical yeah. space? It it it's it, it certainly tracks. But how does that? You talked about the teacher help desk. Is there any other way inside the actual physical room that that manifests itself? Is there students being being allowed almost come in and out of the room, or the ones who are taking care of themselves? Do they have a separate space? How does that? How does that look physically? So um, I keep on in the physical space and in the information space and in those shared understanding space. I keep coming back to the idea of options and choice. Yeah. So you go and so and so that you're better off defining those choices rather than leaving a vacuum. So you say, um, look, uh, for the next phase, here here are five different ways you can go about it. Um, uh, here are five different spaces. That you have access to each is set up a little bit differently so imagine a quiet space one of the great downfalls of open learning spaces is pro is problematic acoustics so so let's create a, a quiet focus space and you go there to be left alone and to um uh, and to work in focus um over here there's a teacher help desk oh look we've got certain kids who are experts in particular topics to wear a bit of a name tag that okay. says expert Here's an expert speller. Here's an expert in ancient Egypt. It's their sort of weird passion. Here's a, here's a tech troubleshooter. So we've put an information tag 
on kids themselves, on the learners themselves, and now they can become teachers. And so now you've got an option of going to a peer tutor rather than a teacher. So we've created almost option living, walking options for help, even in the actual student body. And is that a is that a hard sell for the students? Is that something that is you find is hard to get students on board for? Because, you know, the idea of being a peer support can I'm sure there are plenty of kids to whom that appeals, but I imagine there would be plenty for whom that would be almost a nightmare this idea of being oh i don't want to be the expert now i can de- I definitely see how that is something that can be overcome once the, th- the situation gets bad in but it, it to what extent is that is that is overcoming that getting the kids on board in such a in such a situation and to what extent is that a, is that a problem and how might it be resolved yeah i mean the 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 problem the problem with all of this is getting the balance right. So this is so much around yeah. balance because you don't want an ex- a kid who's teaching his peers or her peers so much that she or he doesn't have time to um, actually get learning on with their sales. own learning. On the other hand, sometimes yeah. teaching is the best learning experience. So, so much of this is balance. Um, the kids, uh, as much as the teachers can be resistant to these sorts of reimaginings of learning, we often had to, talked about detoxing the kids from their suppositions about school. If they've been, if they've been used to showing up to a space and being told what to do and getting rewarded for doing the right thing, and now we're confronting them with choice, ambiguity, entrepreneurial mindsets, etc. Uh, let's not expect them all to applaud. Some of them will applaud. Some of them will kick or scream all the day, all all day. But unless we're expecting them to go into a job where they're just told what to do by a manager all day, which You know, those jobs still exist. I've seen them over the last four years, but um, they're the ones that are going to be replaced by AI. They're lower paid and... um, and, uh, Fewer and further between, yeah. Fewer and further between and and humans are capable of so much more. So let's not put that ceiling there. But kids kids will find it hard and they will struggle. Um, part, Part of the solution is to bring them into the design process in the first place. And part of the solution is that iterative journey. So... So experiment with them and then reflect with them. So what we would often see, I mean, um, our most ambition, ambitious project was 180 kids, all of year five and year six, all day, every day, year in, year out, in one open learning space with six teachers. And they wow. would constantly, um, this is, yeah, what I refer to as sort of scaling this up around the school. This wasn't just some pilot projects. This changed utterly how we did school and um, they would constantly reflect. They'd have a Friday afternoon reflect time with the students to get the balance right. And Because as, as we created space for emergence, bad things emerged. Imagine little social learning clicks that others are not allowed into. Yeah. Um, you know, that couldn't happen in a constrained factory situation, but because a lot of the learning was now social and organic, we had to constantly come back to... to, to, to nurturing the social learning culture um but you know that's what that's what again that's what we have to confront in all of life the kids needed to learn how to navigate that then um we this people talk about teaching kids to collaborate but you don't do that in a group task that's not how you teach we've all done that we've we've landed at university and then told being told to do a group task and it's the worst thing in the world so so we taught collaboration every second of the day and it be- and 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 people and the kids became experts at it, and they they became experts at putting up boundaries. No, I can't talk to you now. And actually, we need to include that other student um, because we confronted those issues in the heat of the battle, and re- and kept on reflecting with the kids as to how to how to how to grapple with it. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a really it sounds like a really positive outcome uh, within that shared learning space. I wanted to ask you a little bit about to what extent do digital technologies bleed into the facilitation of this kind of social learning collaborative culture um, within this idea of design for emergence? Like, do they, do you find them to be a good assistant in that regard? Or is it about having the right digital technology in place, using it at the right time? And of course, it's interaction with the physical space as well. So to what extent do, to what role, what role do they play within that culture? Yeah, we found it absolutely critical. And I think this is why uh, there's been, I I came across a lot of talk from veteran teachers about open learning environments in the 1970s. 
and that they ultimately went down in history as a bit of a failure. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's because we, they, the, the technology was not there. I really think that. I think part of allowing these more sophisticated environments is having sophisticated information flows. Now, um, that can be analog, you know, writable surfaces. We, we just covered every every wall with um, with writable paint. Uh, so so rather than having one person write on a whiteboard, I, I used to say the classroom itself became a giant paper napkin. You know, you're sitting there just to jot down some ideas. And so kids were thinking out loud organically and they were drawing diagrams and they were annotating each other's plans. Furthermore, even in the analog space, you can create progress dashboards. Progress dashboards were critical. I mean, they're... they're they're baked into a lot of systems now in the ter- in terms of badging and level up. So, you know, I dare say I don't know the Atomy system very well, but um, my bet is that there's progress markers and they, and they become really critical. Mm. But th- that can be analog as well. Um, and uh, there's uh, just such an ecosystem of systems. Um, uh, Edmodo was really critical. So the kids could constantly get onto a live chat channel, post their work, get fe- fe- uh, peer feedback. All of the kids had their own bring your own devices. I know some schools have school provided devices and that's fine. Um, but, uh, but we had bring your own devices. And so for us, it was about student ownership. And so the kids would use their own tools, even within their computers. Um, and uh, we'd work off Google, um, Google Docs. So they would be editing each other's Google Docs. So there's this pretty complex ecosystem of information flows that were occurring. And again, it wasn't centrally controlled. Certain aspects were centrally controlled. Um, you know, we had we used Moodle as a learning management system um, back in those days, um, and so there was a kind of an a, of a technological backbone that that created a core structure. But then it was almost like a bubble bath of other technologies yeah. um, and emergence. So a bit of a balance between between um, structure and emergence, and. Um, and it created rich opportunities that, that, that were never quite scripted. Um, but, uh, yeah, it all kind of worked. A lot of it was, a lot of the emergence came from we create choice in all of those three layers and then the kids and the teachers themselves kind of now have, from moment to moment, enough opportunity to kind of make it work one way or the other. And that, that was the sweet spot for us. Yeah, which is such a, I mean, it, it really speaks to an idea that, I'm really on board with this, which is the idea of, you know, when you talk about having devices in the hands of the kids, something that, you know, children are going to be familiar with. And it's such a big part of life outside of school for them anyway. It naturally makes sense that that's going to be a great facilitator of learning. There is the opposite end of the spectrum of thinking, which is, you know, you hear about schools who are, will talk to a huge degree about the dangers of having phones in the classroom and will ban all sorts of devices and while that's one extreme obviously i was wondering how did you control for because there is that risk of students taking advantage of a situation where there are all these different technologies at play how do you how do you keep that spirit of innovation and we're bringing different resources into the room but also this can't just become a chance for a big, massive, you know, live chat on a Google Doc. Yeah, so this um, this is we come back to culture actually, because um, uh, if if our mechanism for getting this right is external, an external force. So, for instance, uh, you know, that's where you get the school saying, actually, well, no, no, th- this is too toxic. This is hurting our kids. We need to make school a technology-free zone or a phone-free zone. And I'm um, not actually entirely discounting that. There's a time and a place um, to, to create that space. Kids are not adults, and sometimes they do need rescuing. But it, it feels to me like it's a bit of a re- retreat position. And if that's the only governing principle, I think the bar is very low indeed. Um, so yeah. the, ultimate, the, end, the ultimate end game is to train up an internal culture. So the kids ultimately have got to get to a place where they self-regulate, um, where they they get it. They have, they've actually got a bit of life wisdom in them and we've got to give them chances to, to, to learn that life wisdom and, and to cultivate a culture where, um, where the kids, um, um, are making the, those right choices. 
it gets tricky because each kid is a bit different um, and you're going to get some pitfalls. You're going to get situ you're going to get extremes. I mean, these are the ones that make it into the media is the extremes. And of, of course, you're going to find a yeah. kid who's, you know, so buried in their own technology that they've lost all contact with civilization. Of course, that's going to happen. Um, but um, but but let's not be reactive. I think ultimately, I keep coming back to nurturing a sort of um, expertise and a, a set of mindsets in the students where they're where they're, they're noticing. How do you feel when you've buried yourself in a Google Doc um, for two hours and you've had no fresh air? How does it feel when you get silly and so you start deleting somebody else's work in a Google Doc? And mm. the, it's got to come intrinsically. Um, if it doesn't at school, it won't as adults. We'll just get adults who um, are reactive and, and passive and um, who can't self-govern. So, and, and kids can self-govern from very early, a very early age. Um, I've, it's been a hell of a journey for us. You may have heard in, in the podcast in the background our little 10-year-old baby um, waking up um, earlier in the podcast. Actually, uh, it hasn't. It hasn't been coming through for me. It's a very, very okay. well behaved baby. Well, I have to say. Look, it's a little bit of an Easter egg because I think if, if people rewind and tune in, they'll they'll catch it. Yes. But I've been struck at you know even even our little ten month old. You know she is she, she is as as vulnerable and as sort of um, young as she is. She is make she's a bit of a person basically. And she. <laughs> She's trying to govern her own life, even at that age. And you look at preschoolers and the way they, they do run their own lives. They've got willpower. They make choices. They explore their environment. They build. They destroy. All of the things that makes you to be a human is there from, from day dot. And and, so and, and, not... and and you respond. If you're a child, you do respond to being given the freedom, the autonomy to do that, right? Yeah. Like we've... You know, I remember a guest we've had on the podcast before, um, uh, Gavin McCormick, who's a Montessori principal, talking about how in his Montessori, it's all about giving kids that that freedom. And he had some some great examples of how they responded to that with these great innovations of their own in a different sphere, obviously, at a different age level. But yeah, I suppose it it, it is the, the perfect response to that problem. I suppose, it, it, as you say, it's not going to work for everyone all of the time and it, and it will take time. But giving the autonomy, creating the culture, the the environment to say, you know, we're in this together and we're, we're trusting you to a certain extent to self-govern and you'll see the responses from that. Yeah, so let's think of an expanding circle of trust and of, self, um, of self-direction and, and of internal autonomy. And wherever, wherever a school is at, let's, let's open up that circle a bit. It'll result in a few crisis, crises. Right, so it'll fall over a bit. That's okay. Push through that. Learn the lessons. Then expand the circle again. Then expand the circle again. Time and time again throughout history, history has changed when humans self-organize around core principles and they just make it happen. Nobody tells them to. There's no rules. They smash through the rules and they make amazing stuff happen. So the, the limits we are putting on the younger generation still... Um, like there is no end to the potential that could be unleashed if we can just get those higher levels of autonomy. And so we, we've just got to keep boldly increasing them. And if it, if it blows up in some situations, that's okay. Let's learn from that and keep going down that path. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, the, you're always worth coming back to self-determination theory. For me, it's an old chestnut. Um, uh, you know, a good body of research that talks about autonomy, mastery, and relatedness. And I'd always be looking at those three ingredients um, for humans stepping up yeah. and being the best that they can be. And you can't, uh, you can't ignore the autonomy. You know, we, 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 we want to be autonomous. And when we're autonomous, that's when the magical things happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that's so much of a, of a backbone of what innovation is all about, you know, creating the conditions for the autonomy that gives rise to the best kinds of innovation. And I guess, I mean, the next question I was going to ask you was to run us through some examples of um, of the best exemplary learning innovations you've encountered. I feel like we've touched on a few already. They've just organically come up. Yeah. But, um, you know, if anything, if there's anything else, any other examples uh, that you can think of? Well, I mean, one that one that springs to mind. It's this zone zone program. So this was all of year five and year six. So it's one hundred and eighty kids. And one example of of a term uh, of a ten week um, unit that they undertook 
um, it was around um, uh, the built environment and cities, and they they because they had uh, that one hundred eighty they had room for one hundred eighty kids, so they carved up one sixth of that space, okay. and they cleared away the furniture and they made it a blank a blank space. And over the course of the term, they physically built a model city in that space. 180 kids did. Oh, wow. And so to do that, um, the kids ended up having wearing different hats. Some of them were town planners. Some of them were financial controllers. You know, um, uh, uh, they had, again, this sort of this structure to the project that allowed the kids to delve into different areas of expertise. And they had rules of engagement. So... If you wanted to suggest where the roads were going to go in this in this city that was being designed, um, you could propose it, but then it had to go through a committee <laughs> made up of the kids, and those kids were experts in road their planning. own little bureaucracies, um, and so they popping up. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, absolutely, yes, and uh, yeah, um, and uh, and so each of these different roles was backed up with online learning, so. So there were kids learning, you know, earning their traffic control badge and kids earning their sort of marketing badge. Um, there were expert sessions. So you can imagine with six different teachers, they could be running face-to-face -face workshops at different points. And often what they do, they'd run the same workshop maybe six times or ten times over two or three weeks. And some of them were compulsory. Yeah. So, okay, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what role you are. Um... A core competency here is, um, you know, and it would have been literally a literacy skill that was being embedded in the project. So you have to come to this masterclass, but you get to choose when. So if you're on a roll, if you're focusing now, or you're trying to build your roads right now, don't come to the one that we're running now. And that made all the difference is the kids were showing up with their own two feet at the time that was right for their flow. Oh, autonomy, and they yeah. still got... Yeah, they still got, we, we were still assured that every single kid had gone through that particular uh, gate. Um, so there were, and, and the, there was assessment processes there as well. And so there were all of these paths mapped out. Some of them were central for all kids. Some of them were these sort of role-based ones. And in terms of progress and the physical space, you, you literally saw a city um, being built over the course of the term. Now, I don't know if, if for this podcast, if you, I don't know if you publish resources along with each episode, but I can flick you through the, I think I've got the time-lapse video of the, of the video being created. Please do. Yeah, absolutely. I would, would love to put that out. I mean, I'd love to just even see that for myself because it sounds yeah. really fascinating, but yeah, we'll definitely, it, definitely include that. I, I mean, it was just amazing. One other one, and so we could spend time on, on that all, all day, but one other thing that that same teacher team did, and this was a one-off, is a, um, uh, they, they, they envisaged um, as a very steep learning curve for kids um, a, a day with no teachers. Oh, wow. I don't know how to this day they pulled this off, but they, they, it was, furthermore, it was the first two days of the, of the year. So the kids were coming fresh and they got all 180 kids in that space without any teachers for two days. Oh, wow. So they had to, the kids came in and there were clues and they had to read those clues. That, I mean, you can imagine even at a safety level, you had to have teachers peering in from different um, windows. You had a few sort of, and I'd almost call them NPC characters who, who were sitting on chairs checking for safety, but were not allowed to talk. Okay, I see. Um, I've got video footage of that one as well. It was, it was, I mean, talk about pushing the boundaries. I'm, by the way, I'm not recommending that as somebody's first experiment. This Too late now. All of critical. our teachers are listening to this saying, okay, I'm not coming in tomorrow. Yep. All of the, the kids can look after themselves. Yeah, we built Although up in a way, I mean, it, 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 I mean, genuinely though, I mean, this might be a bit of a stretch, but it almost... It ties into a little bit of, of what teachers are being faced with at the moment, in a way. I mean, this, because it's obviously in so many places around the world, so much of, of teaching has to be moved and classrooms have to be moved online now with kind of partial closures of schools. I know it's an ongoing situation, but I guess in a way, again, a bit of a stretch, but devolving the, pers the responsibility to students within what you're talking about there, but it does in a way sort of apply to the situation we're in now where kids will have to be faced with that self-direction to a large extent in their learning that they're going to have to be doing at home. Would that be fair yeah. to say? Well, yeah, unfortunately it's um, from one extreme to it to the other. So rather than 
um, an evolved, sophisticated setup, it's actually it's actually throwing people into an extreme situation. True. So the worst version of self direction is a kid alone at a computer screen being asked to do stuff. And uh, the last uh, three days in Australia, I'm seeing on my Facebook feed close friends of mine uh, dealing with tears um, from day to day from from the kids. Um, extremely stressed parents because they're trying to recreate a great learning environment at home without a teacher, mm. with schools sending undeveloped resources home, and some schools are sending very high expectations. They're saying things like, you've got to follow the timetable. You've got to complete this work by the end of the day, but now there's no teacher. So I think there is, I think there is an opportunity there. Um, and on the other side of this, to reflect on, well, what is possible for a student to do? But I'm, I'm, what I'm concerned is that the, the, the circumstances that this has happened in are so extreme that it's only going to create trauma and that coming back, um, coming back to normal schooling, uh, the attitude will be, well, let's put that behind us as soon as we can. Uh, so I'd love to think that, at least in, in some scenarios, yeah, that, that some really great insights are going to come out about how, how people can step up when there's not a teacher directly present. But I'm concerned that actually um, it may turn out that it's such an extreme... Yeah, in terms of learning design, um, if so far in the last three days, it feels like everything around this is, is, is quite difficult. It's not what I would call good, sophisticated, evolved learning yeah. design. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we're breaking the teacher as well because the teacher, we never broke the teacher-child relationship. Everything we did was to strengthen the teacher-learner relationship. Yeah. Um, and whereas this this is in danger of, yeah, of breaking that core bit of glue. Would you say, now, this could just be searching for silver linings in what is obviously a very dark cloud, but would you say that okay of course all of those challenges that you've that you've brought up exist and it's all happening so quickly which makes this almost this tidal wave of difficulty but within that there is i guess a responsibility upon but also the scope for you know online learning and the use of that and that information flow that you're talking about to almost step up and fill gaps that before it wouldn't have had to but do you think that capability exists do you think that there's the chance that we can, of course, not repl- nothing can replace the physical experience, but find a temporary workable solution that can almost teach us a few things going forward and create almost some new systems of learning that, okay, maybe they came out of an unideal yeah. situation, but, you know, again, as I say, could be looking for a silver linings, but do you think there's any scope for that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, at a really practical level, the, the, the knowledge that schools have of online systems, whether it's a learning management system or, or um, uh, services like um, Atomy, um, uh, prior, you know, the, the level of awareness of what these systems are, what they can do, will be, um, is going to be vastly and rapidly increased. So it becomes a tool that can then be brought back into the ecosystem with far greater fluency on the other side of this. Um, uh, so I think absolutely there's a, that's going to be a silver lining. Um, at the, so simultaneous with that, I think um, uh, uh, school, schools have very rapidly got to send the message back to homes that this is a national crisis and that we need to be removing pressure for home learning to be driven in the same way that it would be in a classroom, so so um, yeah. uh, so so let's because mental mental health is critical right now. We need kids. Kids are going to be anxious. Their parents are going to be anxious. Maybe they're stuck at home. Dad's lost his job. Um, uh, so they're in tight proximity. They're not. They're barely able to go outside much. And suddenly you're trying to get them to reach. You know, to meet outcome three point two using some pack that you know. Some, someone's loaded up onto a Google Classroom. So, <laughs> so yeah. I would be taking the pressure off if I was schools right now. I'd be giving permission to just um, r- really have that off button. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but I think through that process, there's, a, there's um, the, the awareness of what can be done online. And really, 
one-stop shop systems where where you just say, hey kids, here's the system. Um, if you can do half an hour of maths each day, you log in, the video's there, that you're getting feedback right there. You can explore some cool topics in this in this history content, whatever it is. Like, and then just focus on being well and enjoying the learning and like, let's just take yeah. the pressure off. And I do think digital systems can really step up, but I think that'll be undermined if schools try to replicate what they do in the classroom at a, at a, at a, at a home learning level. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. It's, it's, it's such a precarious time in that regard and, and ever evolving. So it's really a case of, of, of see how we go. Um, but it's wise words in relation to, uh, in relation to school leadership and the approach that's to be taken, which hopefully can be heard. But in a way that sort of ties into um, the last thing that I wanted to ask you was this idea of interacting with leadership, because obviously it's a big part of your role, bringing about innovation, you know, it change comes from the top down, at least in decision-making terms. So I wanted to ask when it comes to dealing with school leadership, when it, you know, you're looking to bring in these innovations. What, how, how do you find that experience? What are the challenges that you would generally face? Uh, are there recurring challenges? Is it different from school to school? And how would you overcome them? I mean, leadership's critical, I think. Uh, and I think the leader is critical. So the principal is critical. Um, and schools over time, they, they grow into the image of the vision that's set by the leadership. Um, so it starts with a leader, then it spreads to shared leadership, and then it cascades through the school. Um, mm. Often you have innovators who are at a sort of deputy level, or, or they're in the leadership team, but they're flummoxed because there's not an overarching vision. And unfortunately, I've, I've got to be frank in my experience, a lot of leadership, um, because schooling is such a conservative sector, um, is leaders got there by by because they are inherently a little bit conservative. They're reassuring to parents and no one yeah. likes experimenting on kids, <laughs> right? We don't want our young people to be the guinea pigs. And so there's this real uh, resistance to risk taking. And it's a shame because that's that's actually the worst thing. Um, the, the worst way to approach it. So what I would always be looking for in leadership, uh, whether it's that principal or that broader leadership team, is to find a way to take a risk. Yeah. So it's going to mean reassuring parents. It's going to mean, um, you know, you can't let go of your security in one big go. You're going to have to iterate it. But um, I'd be always pushing leadership teams to take bigger and bigger risks. The best, the best learning programs I've seen came about in schools that had failed. So they were already in crisis. So they couldn't hang on to uh, an illusion of control anymore. Yeah. They had to reinvent. Um, and so, um, you know, that's often where I'd get, I'd be able to go and work and engage is in schools where um, now there was massive potential because they'd let go of a bit of control. And um, that's what worked at our school as well as a principal who was willing to take risks um, um, to get a bit of a maverick spirit happening at the school and uh, was happy to sponsor that. And um, so that's always what I'd be looking for. Um, uh, for, to, to see yeah, real progress in changing the paradigm at schools. Um, right this second, though, to, 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 which is a, a very different chapter than, than normal, I'd say um, school leadership teams need to, 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 to remove the pressure on home learning. I, it, it genuinely concerns me um, the, the, the experience that kids will be going through the next few weeks yeah. or possibly even months if schools just are relentlessly trying to create that relentless learning progress uh, during a uh, a one-off um, massive societal crisis is we need to be thinking in terms of mental health and and um, not just uh, panicking over bloody learning outcomes all the time yeah uh, this is the worst time for that factory mentality to be being applied at home environments but in normal in the normal run of things I'd just say leaders have got a um, um, uh, find a way to take risks. Uh, find a way to take risks. Yeah. If, it, if it doesn't start with leadership, teachers teachers are not going to innovate and take risks if their leaders are not doing that. So unless the leaders are putting their their necks on the line and saying 
provocative things to the parent body, like setting a vision to the parent body um, and challenging the parents in their thinking and bringing in the parents into the conversation. You, you know, we can sniff culture and we can sniff vision off from a mile off. So then don't expect the teachers to risk take unless they can see it being lived and breathed in leadership vision. And then don't expect kids to take risks unless the teachers are, are taking genuine personal risks and putting themselves in a place of scary, vulnerable growth. Yeah. But that it always comes back from leadership. It flows from leadership and, and that sets the ceiling on what's possible within a school. Yeah, and, and, and can it be, I guess, to that end, does it always have to be the case that it that you do need a leader in a school who is themselves, you know, open to the possibility or can it be, have, do you find it can be cultivated in school leadership? Have you met with school leaders where you, you've been principals who you've been able to win them over? Or is it the case that you know straight away if somebody, if somebody has that or if they just don't? Yeah. As a consultant in, in that, in that consultancy um, aspect of my life, uh, it's an absolute no, no to win them over. Because then it's my, okay. ultimately what happens then, it's my dream, not theirs. And that'll last for a week or five minutes or a term. But it has to, the light bulb has to come in and, and the consultant is not the person to turn on the light bulb. The consultant can um, set the scene for leadership teams to to galvanize around a light that's already turned on. But but it's really dangerous for, 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 for a consulting role to to try to instill that from the outside in. But I think there's other structures that can allow the light bulb to turn on and that's leadership um, networks. I think conferences can do that. Public discourse about schooling can do that. Um, and that can take leadership journey, leader teams on their own journey. I can facilitate a journey, but that it's got to emerge for internally and that's that's the fine line. So if until I can see that within a leadership team, I can't work uh, I can't work because it's going to be my it's going to be my journey, not theirs. But but le- leadership, um, all of that public discourse, so conferences, leadership networks, and those sorts of things. I think visiting other schools. So that's why I really liked other teams coming and visiting our school because we would shock. I mean, we, you would see the blood drain out of the, out of their faces, and suddenly they could never never see the factory paradigm again. They could never say, they could never poo poo um, and criticize alternatives because they they could see. Um, I've seen it working yeah, yeah, they, well, in real time. They'd spend two hours walking around our school and no matter where they looked, there were these engaged kids and uh, collapsed classrooms and this hive of very high energy activity. Um, and so I think going and seeing other learning spaces that have, have, have challenged the core paradigm, I think that's probably the most powerful way to to get that internal shift happening. Yeah, amazing. It's no substitute for experience, I suppose. Um, so that it's really fascinating material on leadership and indeed in innovation and learning in general. Um, unfortunately, that is all that we have time for today on that subject, but you're not quite off the hook yet. We always like to finish by asking our guests for just a brief, fun little bit of advice to teachers out there, or maybe it's a little anecdote from your journeys in the world of education, just something to, particularly, I guess, in a time like this, maybe put a little bit of a smile on a teacher's face or give them a nice little tip to help them get through. So over to you, Steve. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, if we wind the clock way, way back, so this was early days, I think I just landed, I was over the moon because I'd just um, been endorsed by this by that school a few years into my teaching career to, to have a bit of ro- a bit of a role trying to spark innovation. None of the big transformations had taken place yet um, at our school, but I had a bit of permission to, 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 to get some cool ideas happening with some teachers. And who should I come across but Sue Tamlett, oh. who now works at Atomy. So she yes. joined as Our listeners teacher. will know Sue well. Yes. So I believe yes. she's a regular on the podcast. So, so she, oh, she absolutely she, is superstar. Superstar. So she just joined yes. the school. Um, at the time in the in, in, in English and um, uh, you know with all of her energy and her excitement and and uh, and uh, I met with her and this idea that we um, hit on for, for, for teaching Shakespeare was um, to what if we um, had Shakespeare 
uh, dial in to the classroom via video conference and could make multiple appearances. And so guess who had to dress up as Shakespeare? And I remember I had this sort of um, Shakespearean mask, this full full head mask that wouldn't breathe. And it was summer. And so, uh, you know, I was absolutely drenched with sweat and I didn't even show up face to face. Part of the part of the mystique of it was let's get me sort of dialed video in on the big screen yeah. and they could ask yeah. questions. And so that was it. It was just a fun little thing that, it, that, that, that made life a bit more interesting and the, the kids loved it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, that was probably one of my first interactions and collaborations with Sue. And there's been many since then. And there is something to a bit of fun, isn't there? Um, yes. and I think we need fun right now. Um, I, I, for myself, working from home the last week and a half, um, I'm taking it a day at a time and I'm, I'm relieving pressure on myself to achieve my own goals. The most important goal right now is staying well, um, mentally well. Um, and I don't want to find myself in three weeks from now having slowly deteriorated and then I'm then getting to a dark place. And I, I think... A bit of fun, something mm. con- that connects us each day, something that gives us hope each day. Um, and it's got to be a day at a time. I-, I can't bear to think about the next six months. It's just one day at a time. And, um, yeah, I think that's how we're going to approach it. Yeah, well, it's, very, it's really sound advice, and it's a wonderful anecdote. Had it been any other teacher you were talking about to be involved in that, I might have, I might have questioned the truthfulness of it. But knowing Sue as I do, that, that certainly tracks that certainly sounds like something she would uh, definitely be involved with. And indeed, that you would be involved with based on everything you've said today and your openness to, to innovation and crazy wacky ideas, wacky ideas such as those. Um, and I'm sure she'll enjoy hearing that story again Yeah, uh, yeah. when she listens to us. Absolutely. It'll take us back. <laughs> certainly will. Certainly will. All righty. Well, listen, Steve, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us and sharing your wisdom, which can hopefully... Uh, uh, provide some some great advice to people in as you say a, a tough and, and tricky time to everybody out there in the meantime uh you can check us out on our main site at getatomy.com or listen to another one of our episodes on whatever platform you're listening to this on for now it is goodbye from steve see you guys thanks for having me it's been a, such a pleasure and goodbye from me see ya <laughs>